Yo, what's the word, gang? So we got a couple of things to report on. So first of all, you know, we're going to get to that Young Thug trial. You know, they almost had another mistrial today. And what's what's puzzling is, is that these actions keep taking place as if it's like an isolated event when the whole time it's a pattern. You know what I'm saying? It's becoming a pattern where the prosecutors are using certain tactics. Now, they mentioning, you know, one of the guy's names that wasn't supposed to be mentioned because, for one, they never, you know, told him prior to him taking a stand that his client was going to be mentioned. So they've been pulling all type of slick acts when it comes to that. Then you got Woody, right? Um, I'm going to play that footage of um, the actual, you know, dismissal as well as some more little footage of the testimony, right? Um, so stay tuned. But, um, you know, you got Woody. Woody is basically, Woody is basically saying that, Young Thug, he expresses his regret for what he did to him. I will never forgive myself. I was evil. Now, do y'all believe that? Do y'all believe that he really regret what he done? Like, as far as, you know, like this is beyond, you know, some sort of street lingo or some sort of street thing where snitching and all that. You know, if you work the job and, you know, just so happened you came in late seven minutes and one of your coworkers was one of your partners, and you've been coming in seven minutes late at 8.07 every day, but you clock in at, you know, 8 o'clock. And then they go reveal to your supervisor or your boss that you've been clocking in at 8 o'clock, but you're really supposed to clock in at 8.07. You will feel some type of way, right? You'll feel like that person out at you, snitched on you, and they're not loyal to you, correct? Y'all get in the comments and y'all let me know because that's the most simplest way to put it. You know what I'm saying? It, it's, it's some sort of loyalty amongst these people, right? And it's supposed to be loyalty in life, not just in the crime world, but in general. You know, you my friend, you my friend. You know what I'm saying? You my blood, you my blood. But, um, you know, a lot of times it don't be like that. But let me play this first footage. This is Lil Woody basically saying his regret. You can walk in that courtroom and say one thing to thug right now. What would that be? I'm sorry. What you sorry for? The pain, the suffering, everything got caused on him and his family, society, the courts. I'm sorry for everything. I wish, I wish I had the strength and the mindset I have now. I'm just, I never forgive myself. Yeah. So, like, like I said, I don't really buy that. You know, at this point, you know what I'm saying. You doing interviews, you know. At some point, this will be a movie. You know, this trial, whether he lose or win, this will be a movie. So he'll be tied into that. You know what I'm saying? He'll be tied into that. People don't realize that part. They think, oh, it's all about the interviews and the money now. No, nah, bro, this shit going to be going on for a minute. He's going to be tied into some of the documentaries that's going to be made in the future, especially with this prosecution, you know, with all these different mix-ups and mishaps. And, you know... The judges, both judges are pretty much trying to make it like some sort of isolated event, like it just took place. But in real time, you know, these things been taking place all throughout the trial. So it's some sort of pattern, you know, it's a pattern. But um, let me get to it. Let me play the footage of this testimony as well as the footage of them getting denied, you know, this mistrial. So y'all get in the comments and y'all let me know what y'all think. Down for the cloud chaser. For ease, this is starting the starting of the Act 159. Okay, thank you. Officer Rogers, where are you employed? Uh, city of Atlanta Police Department. And how long have you been with the City of Atlanta Police Department? I just entered my 14th year. And if you can tell the jury briefly about your history with the Atlanta Police Department. Uh, well, I let the Atlanta Police Department work patrol for a little while before moving over to the special operations section. Did about eight years there before moving over to special enforcement, uh, where I did time at the auto crimes unit and my last assignment there was at Gaines okay. before my incident. And we're going to talk about your incident in a moment. Yes, um, when you were a patrol officer, what zone did you work for? I started in zone six. And did you work any other zones as a um, patrol officer? No, ma'am. All right. Now, you said that your last assignment prior to your incident was you working in gangs. Yes, ma'am. What did you do um, while you worked in gangs? 
Uh, while on gangs, it was we were tasked with proactive enforcement, uh, keeping up with wanted gang members and apprehension of the apprehension of those persons, and that was about the gist of it. And how long did you work um, as an officer in the gang unit? I was only there for eight months. And in those eight months, while you worked as an officer in the gang unit. What, if anything, did you do differently than the investigators in the gang unit? Uh, typically, we were out in the streets more, uh, certain high crime areas, presence, things of that nature. And as an officer with the gang unit, did you have a specific, excuse me, specific zone that you worked, or did you work the entire city of Atlanta? Citywide. And how closely did you work with the investigators in the gang unit as an officer in the gang unit? We worked hand in hand. If they had certain targets or subjects that they wanted apprehended, we would go out and look for them. And was that one of the primary responsibilities as an officer to, to assist with the apprehension of um, suspects? Yes, ma'am. I want to direct your attention to February 7th, 2022. Okay. Were you working that day? Yes, ma'am. And what was your normal shift when you worked um, as an officer with the gang unit? Uh, my normal shift was Tuesday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And let me ask, in 2022, were you working as an officer in the gang unit? Yes, ma'am. When you began your shift today, um, were you assigned to assist in any apprehensions on that day, February 7, 2022? Uh, at the start of that day, we didn't have any uh, activity. We were actually waiting on fugitive to go and serve a paper that day or serve a warrant that day. And we were made aware that the target got mobile and that's when we were called. And who was the target that um, Fugitive was looking to arrest that day? Uh, Mr. Christian Eppinger for the charges of armed robbery and aggravated assault, I believe the case was. Mm -hmm. And how did you get involved with the apprehension of Mr. Eppinger? Well, we were contacted by the surveillance investigator at the time, Investigator Storno, and uh, so we made our way from Marietta Boulevard over to Cleveland Avenue. Uh, me and my partner for the day, we uh, staged for a little bit and briefed while we tried to gather more resources and uh, get be updated on uh, current information of his status and whereabouts. Okay, and you said your partner for the day, let me first ask you, was your partner in the same vehicle as you? Uh, no, ma'am, we were in two separate cars. Okay. And if you're in separate cars, how was it that he was your partner for the day? Uh, we typically do everything in twos, but we were the only two officers uh, for my unit working that day. And who was this other officer? Uh, officer Jay Teasley. Teasley? Yes, ma'am. T-E-A-S-L-E-Y? Yes, ma'am. All right. And you said that, were you both at Marietta prior to getting the call to assist? We were, in, we were in the area. I was on Marietta Boulevard. I don't know his specific location on the west side that day, but we were uh, over there. And you said that once you received the call to assist, is that when you made your way over from Marietta Boulevard to Cleveland Avenue? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Once you got over to Cleveland Avenue, um, did you go directly on Cleveland Avenue or did you stay somewhere else prior to getting on Cleveland Avenue? Uh, no, ma'am. Prior to, so we briefed, him and myself, we briefed on the side of the Interstate 75 just before Cleveland. Uh, talked about what we were going to do and what, who we were looking for, what he was wearing, things of that nature. Tried to gather more resources as far as zone crime suppression units. I think I called upon the fugitive unit that day, but they were tied up doing something else. Now, do you remember what the description was that you were given for him? Uh, we were told black jacket, white pants. I believe it was an orange hoodie. Tell us your 
what happened once you got over to Cleveland Avenue? All right. After the brief, um, investigator Storno told us that he had left the gas station and was out on foot. If you hear an objection, if you'll just pause. I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. It's okay. I know it's a little bit hard to hear. Everybody needs to use their mics. Hearsay. Yes. Your effect on the listener. Um, sustained. Okay. Without I mean, some, I'm sorry, overruled. Overruled. Okay. Based upon what Investigator Storno did, said, what did you all do? Uh, he told us he was on foot walking from the gas station into the condominium complex. At that time, we left the side of the interstate, uh, moved in, coming down Cleveland Avenue, turned on the steel road, at which time I locked eyes on Mr. Evinger, uh, pulled into the complex. Let me stop you right here. Mm -hmm. um, you said the condos in which he was going to. Do you recall the name of those condos? I don't. The address, I believe, is 2637 Old Hateville. I don't know the exact name, the steel row entrance. I don't think it's a specific sign, uh, signage at that entrance. I think the signage is on the other side. Have you heard of Colonial Square Apartments? Yes, ma'am. Does that sound familiar? No. Not at the moment. Okay. That's fine. Um, is this location within Fulton County? Yes, ma'am. Now, you said that the address is 2637 Old Hateville Road. Mm -hmm. um, does the apartment complex have multiple entrances? Yes. Okay. Is one of those entrances on Old Hateville? Yes, ma'am. And is the other on Steel? Yes, ma'am. If you can just describe for the jury, if you're on Cleveland Avenue, what are some um, landmarks where that apartment complex is? Uh, Steel Road sits between the, now it's a Chevron and a Checkers restaurant. I think the address, well, I don't remember the exact address for the Chevron at Cleveland, uh, but it Steel Road sits in between the Chevron right there at Cleveland and Interstate 75 and the Checkers. Okay. Once you got onto Cleveland Avenue, um, what did you do? Uh, turn left on the Cleveland Avenue, coming southbound from the interstate. Uh, we crossed the, the overpass, uh, pulled up at Steel Road, made a left turn onto Steel Road, at which time I could see Mr. Avenger walking through the complex, at which time I meant to go make contact with Mr. Avenger. And at the time when you went to go make um, contact with him, were you inside of the gate at um, 2637 O'Hayville Road? Uh, yes, ma'am. It was, uh, it's a block of homes right there at the entrance. I think I remember him being on the sidewalk. And at that time, once you made entrance inside, um, do you know where your partner was? I don't. Last I checked, he was behind me, uh, turning off of Cleveland Ave on the steel road. Okay. Once you got into the apartment complex and you make, and you see, um, who you believe to be Mr. Aperture, what did you do? Uh, I tried to pull ahead of Mr. Eppinger, get out. I gave him commands, uh, advising him that he did have paper. Also, I uh, told him he had warrants. Uh, he kind of looked at me, looked past me, proceeded to walk past me. At this time, I'm traveling behind Mr. Eppinger. I go to put hands on him, start to pull on him and things of that nature. And as I'm pulling on him, trying to grab him, uh, I kind of start to look over my shoulder, trying to locate my partner because... Uh, Mr. Eppinger at the time was not compliant, still walking, still kind of doing what he was doing. And uh, when my partner uh, wasn't there at that time, I chose to transition from lethal force, uh, downgraded to my taser. I uh, went to go tase Mr. Eppinger, but when I went to go access my taser, I couldn't drop the hood. I didn't drop the hood. And so when I turned my body to access it with my right hand is when I started feeling these shots. So let's kind of... Slow that down, okay? Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you this. At the time and when you went to go apprehend Mr. Eppinger, did you have your body cam on? Yes, ma'am. And did you have dash cam in your vehicle? Yes, ma'am. All right. Now, you said that um, you were, you got out the car and you went to go and grab him. When you got out the car, did you have your gun? Yes, ma'am. I had my gun drawn on him at first. Uh, came out with lethal force. Uh, he was known to carry weapons and things of that nature. Um, 
And like I said, I go to put my hands on him because he kind of walks past me uh, after I told him who I was, announced my agency, let him know that he had warrants. Uh, he kept proceeding down the sidewalk. And so as I'm engaged with him, I'm kind of looking back over my shoulder for my partner. and He isn't coming, so I had to switch to another plan um, since I wasn't physically able to overcome him. And so at that time, I holstered my weapon and uh, decided to switch over to my taser. I had trouble accessing my taser. What made you decide to switch from your gun to your taser? Um, just the sheer size of him. I knew I wasn't going to be able to overpower him, but at the time, he didn't have anything in his hands. And so I uh, felt it necessary to transition. Okay. And so when you went to go transition to your taser... What if it, were you able to draw your taser out? No, ma'am. Uh, I stumbled with my taser at which, with my left hand, at which time I reached over with my right. And at that point, he had flanked me and started to fire upon me. Okay. And we said he started to flank you. What did that mean? Uh, so he had pulled over to my, pulled off, uh, veered off to my right side. Okay. And then did you see when he drew his weapon? I did not. Okay. Uh, what was the first thing that you felt? Uh, just a warm sensation. Uh, but I knew something was wrong because when I went to reaccess my weapon, I could not have use of that arm. And when I turned around to track his person, uh, yeah, all I remember seeing was the muzzle of the gun, the white pants, the black jacket. But at that point, I was pretty much out of the fight. And we say you were out of the fight. What do you mean? Um, it's even after reaching for him. I feel like I remember reaching for him with my left hand, but. My body was kind of beginning to shut down, probably from the blood loss. I don't know. Okay. And once you started feeling those, like that bullets and that impact, did you, where did you end up? Did you, were you on the ground? What happened? Uh, I remember after looking at him, uh, I remember turning away. I feel like I took a knee. I might have even laid on my face. I sat there for a minute. I gathered myself. I got on radio, let radio know I was shot. And then at that point, investigator Johnson uh, came over to render aid. He pulled me around the corner um, and yeah. Okay. And um, after that, were you taken to the hospital? Uh, yes, ma'am. We waited on the ambulance for a little bit, but we kind of had a talk and a discussion and I just requested to be put in one of the UC cars and we made our way to Grady. And so you said you were talking, were you alert at the time after being shot? Uh, yes, ma'am. And did you eventually make it to Grady? Yes, ma'am. And what were the injuries um, that you had as a result of the shooting? Well, I was informed that I was shot six times, once to the back of the head, four to the back of the right shoulder, and one to the back of the right leg. And did you have to spend some time at Grady because of your injuries? Yes, ma'am. I did about seven days in the hospital. And are you now back to work at this point? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Of course, indulgence for a moment. Do you recognize the individual who was in the picture in State Exhibit 32V? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I recognize him to be Christian Eppinger. And I'm also going to show you 18V. Um, do you recognize who's that in 18V? Yes, ma'am. Their profile looks similar to his. And I want to zoom in on 18V. Are you able to see what is depicted on the side of his face? No, ma'am. I'm not able to make that out. Okay. All right. I have no further questions.
Any defense questions for this witness? Just one, All right. Officer Rogers, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right. If I heard you correctly, um, you found out, or you came to find out after the fact, after your encounter with this, uh, this guy, that you were shot a total of six times? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, you were taken to the hospital, and you were there for a period of time before you recovered? Yes, sir. Okay, and you are back to work at this time? Yes, sir. Okay. And you described the person who was on the screen, the person you encountered, the guy you encountered as a, a Mr. Eppinger? Yes, sir. All right. All right, I'm sorry that happened to you, sir. Thank you for your, for your questions. That's all I have, for your answers. That's all I have. Uh, any other? All right. Officer, good afternoon. You don't see that gentleman in this courtroom, correct? No, sir. No further questions. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Any redirect? No redirect, Your Honor. All right. Uh, officer, th um, thank you for your time and your excuse. What is the state? Yes, Your Honor. The state will ask that you deny defendant's um, motion for a mistrial. The state would like to cite the court <clears throat> to Swims v. State, which is 307 Georgia, 651, a 2020 case, Your Honor. In that case, which was the defendant's only enumeration of error, and I'm in Division Two of that um, opinion, Your Honor, Swims contends that the trial court erred in denying his motion for mistrial after his character was improperly placed into evidence during Chelsea Owens' testimony. When the state asked Owens if Swims offered any reasoning for why he wanted to escape, Owens responded, and this is what the witness said in that case, I asked Swims why would he do that. I said, why would you want to do that? He told me because they did not honor his fast and speedy trial. He was looking at getting off on the technicality because they didn't honor that. He didn't have that for his defense. He said he was doing time. He had a lot of time in West Virginia that he wasn't never going to get out. In that case, Swim's trial counsel immediately asked to approach the bench and moved for a mistrial. The trial court judge overruled Swim's objection and denied his motion. The state resumed his direct examination of Owens who then testified that Swims provided another possible motivation for attempting an escape, that Swims had murdered Clemson. I asked him, did y'all kill that child? And he told me, why do you want out of here so bad? So that was how the testimony continued. I'm going to skip down. A trial court's denial of a motion for mistrial based on, the, based on the improper admission of bad character evidence is reviewed for abuse of discretion by examining factors and circumstances, including the nature of the statement. Excuse me. Slow down reading, please. Sorry the other evidence in the case and the action taken by the court and counsel concerning the impropriety. And they cite Smith v. State, 302 Georgia 699. A passing reference to a defendant's incarceration does not place his character in evidence. And they cite Lewis v. State, 287, 287 Georgia 210 at Penn site 212. Furthermore, Owen's passing reference to Swim's incarceration in West Virginia for an unstated crime was an unexpected answer to the question asked by the prosecutor who was attempting to establish that Clemson's murder was the reason Swims wanted out of jail so bad. And they see Walker v. State, 282 Georgia 703. A non-responsive answer that impacts negatively on a defendant's character does not improperly place his character in issue. After Swims' mistrial was denied, the state did not inquire further into Swims' crimes in West Virginia beyond a single confirmation that his incarceration there also served as a motive for escape. Your Honor, given um, what occurred in this case, Your Honor, the state's intention when I asked the question, what was the significance of that picture of the state's intended, intention was solely to talk about the fact that Mr. Kendrick was standing on that car, that car being that of Rayshon Bennett. His mother had identified that car yesterday during her testimony, Your Honor. Um, so it was an inadvertent response which was not responsive to the state's answer, Your Honor. And given that is what occurred, um, Your Honor, the state would ask that you deny um, his, deny their motion. Furthermore, Your Honor, other things, other factors that you look at in order to determine whether or not um, a mistrial should be granted is the nature of the statement, 
other evidence in the case, the actions taken by the store, excuse me, the actions taken by the court. The what? The actions taken by the court was the reference and isolated and brief and whether the jury's exposure was ex was repeated and extensive and was it inadvertent. Um, additionally, Your Honor, in within the indictment, Your Honor, we did charge Mr. Kendrick with as one of the over acts in this indictment, which is Act 58, and he's also charged in this indictment in count 63 of this indictment, Your Honor, a possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, previously convicted of a felony involving the use or possession of a firearm. Your Honor, so for the purposes of having to prove that count of the indictment, we will have to enter into or enter Mr. Kendrick's certified copy of his conviction, of course, with a limiting instruction that that only be used against him, Your Honor. So, so the fact that that came out during um, during that testimony would not be substantially um, more prejudicial, Your Honor, given that one, the jury has heard this indictment, um, and as well as this um, evidence will come out, at least that he was convicted, um, because we have to prove that. A portion of the indictment, Your Honor. So we would ask that the court deny his motion. Deny his motion. <clears throat> All right. And we have instructed our witness past that as well. Ms. Weinstein. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, in the Swims case cited by the state, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do not believe that was a seasoned officer that testified about the bad character. Is that correct? I, I don't know if it was I, a seasoned uh, officer. Yeah, no, I look. It's not. It's, it's it an a inmate, inmate, right? And I think there's a distinction between a fellow inmate and an officer with decades of experience. Um, and it's not just I that think that. I mean, I think if you go back and look at Posey v. State, which you may have already looked at, 152, Georgia Appeals 216. Um, there you have a case where a seasoned officer testified about bad character of a defendant. Um, the court in that case called for, there should have been a mistrial. Um, it says that when it's impossible for the trial court by corrective instruction to rectify the harm done by improper testimony, a mistrial must be granted. Um, and again, the issue here is you have a seasoned officer, someone with years of experience testifying. And in Posey, uh, there's really very instructive language from our courts um, where they say we, we reiterate here. I'm sorry, I'm talking too fast. And too loudly. <laughs> We, yeah, you know what? I'm going to tone it down. We reiterate here what we said in Boyd. It may well be argued that peace officers are not always well acquainted with our rules of evidence and that statements such as the one here are merely inadvertent. I'm going to stop the quote for a second to say something, which is, again, here we have a peace officer. Here we have an investigator who is well seasoned. The quote continues. But if we refuse to reverse this judgment, then we provide no incentive to district attorneys and solicitors to counsel their witnesses, especially law enforcement officers, to avoid extraneous and inadmissible outbursts. It is high time that this court go on record as opposing without reservation such conduct by law enforcement officers. Posey is exactly on point Posey calls for a mistrial. This officer should have known better. The state should have properly prepared the witness to not issue, to not blurt out, to not state so clearly that my client was just getting out of prison. It cannot be corrected, Your Honor. All right. Um, any last words by the state? Well, actually, never mind. It's the defense's motion, so y'all don't get any last words. Um, all right, I, I think I am finding that this was not intentionally elicited on the part of the state. Um, however, I also am finding that this 
witness as a law enforcement officer should have known better than to make any mention of it. Um, it is, however, significant that one of the charges against Mr. Kendrick in this indictment is that he is a convicted felon. Um, were it not for that, I would grant the mistrial motion. Um, but given that this jury already knows that he's been convicted and is a convicted felon um, anyway, even without this testimony, um, I don't think that a mistrial is warranted. I am, however, going to give a curative instruction and um, as a sanction for this having occurred, um, that's the end of the testimony from this witness. There's going to be no more testimony from him. So he's done. All right. Um, what I am proposing to say as an instruction is defendant Kendrick's prior criminal history has no relevance to this case except as to count 63 and should not have been mentioned. Further, this witness, as a former law enforcement officer, should have known better than to make any mention of it. Likewise, Mr. Kendrick's criminal history should not be considered in connection with any of these other defendants or any of the charges against them in this case. Your Honor? Yes, sir. Um, I would also then, because we didn't have the opportunity to cross-examine, so it would be okay. a confrontation, it would be reversible error. So I'm moving... Hey. Let me ask you this. Have y'all cross-examined him the yes. two times before? Yes. All right, so we're going to strike everything yes. he said today. And all right. the notes, just like you did before, all the notes, I have to go back, give them to the court if you don't yeah. mind, put them under seal, or and that's why I remember you doing, but whatever you did with them. And um, if they can't follow that instruction, please alert your right. court if yeah. you don't mind. You're right. Can we just ask that we could just stop our testimony and give them an opportunity to cross-examine him? No. Nope. I you're guess right. you can ask, and the okay. answer is no. But you're, I don't. The think answer is no. You can make a record. Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, I don't believe that he and my my question was broad. It's not and your I, fault. I, and I understand that, but Your Honor, the testimony that was given today, this was a one time and one time infraction, Your Honor, and we would just ask. We can understand that if his testimony, if the state no longer can question him, we would ask that all of his testimony from today is not stricken because of one mistake. Like this was one mistake that he made, Your Honor. We would ask, we would stop our questioning of him, allow the defense to cross him on what has come out now. But all of the information that he's provided this far, he has been careful. He has not said anything today that was even remotely close to what happened here right now. It, I believe it was a mistake on his part. Maybe as a state, I should have instructed clearer and I will take that responsibility, Your Honor. But given that this was one moment in time, the state is gonna ask that we will stop question. If that's the sanction that the state has to stop questioning him, Your Honor, we will take that sanction and ask that the defense be allowed to cross him and that we be not allowed to direct him, and that's fine, but not that his entire testimony from today be struck, Your Honor, given that that was one mistake that he made very short in time, Your Honor. All right, we understood. Do I, I need to respond stands. to that, Your Honor? You don't okay. need to. Thank you. Yes. I did not mention it, but also all the exhibits admitted through this gentleman need to be uh, taken back under seal yeah. as well. And disregarded by the jury, please. Do you have another witness available? Um, yes, Your Honor. We're, okay. we're trying to figure that out. All right. Go ahead and get them lined up. Excuse me, Your Honor. I have, I have one question. Uh, is retired investigator Dennis going to return to the stand at some point? I'm not sure 
if the state had planned on that or not, or if your sanction would bar that as well. Oh, no, no. He won't be returning. Thank you, Your Honor. I just wanted that clarified. Unless you'd like for me to have him come back and admonish him. But I'm not going to do it in front of the jury because I don't think we need to highlight it further. Okay. I kind of would like to tell him he should have known better, though. Y'all can just relay that. Um, okay. Excuse me, Your Honor. And I'd like to renew my motion for mistrial prior to the next question. All right. Um, it is denied. Thank you. Okay. Do, do you have another witness you can put up now, or do I need to give y'all a few minutes? Okay. Okay. 